Yesterday, our social justice GCC committee attended the City Club's conversation with Pastor Mike McBride, who came into town from the Bay Area. Pastor Mike is a leader working to end gun violence with his organization called Live Free and their nonviolent approach identifying peacemakers to go door to door in the inner city. He passionately described the courageous leadership that any one person can do to speak up, voice their concerns, and take action to end gun violence here in America. Pastor Mike left me with a question. What is the best way to be a peacemaker? What is the best way to take action and to lead? What is the best way to lead our country, our community, and our world? Right now in our Parsha, Parsha Pinchas, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory says, the entire Parsha is a mini lesson in how to be a leader. And there are at least four different models of leadership that are presented with this, within this one Parsha that we read. We've already had models of leadership in the Torah. We have Moses, his steady leadership, where he listens to the people and marches them forward, leading the way. We have Miriam's listening ear, her sustenance, providing water and necessary resources to the people, showing care and concern. We have Aaron, who is known as the peacemaker. Ohev shalom, v'rodev shalom. He would constantly pursue peace, seeking compromise and agreement, bending over backwards, putting himself in harm's way, going door to door like those peacemakers in the Bay Area to bring families, individuals, and communities together to sit at the same table, to see each other who for they were and what would bring them together, what unites them. But we also see negative examples of leaders in our Torah. We see the spies who are filled with pessimism and fear, seeing only the impossible, we see Korach, who is greedy and power-hungry, seeking self-interest. We see Balak, a wealthy king, seeking to buy his way to overthrow the Jewish people, and Bilam, the prophet for hire. And then we get to our namesake this week, Pinchas. Pinchas is the grandson of Aaron, Aaron who is known to be the peacemaker of Israel. Pinchas was different. Even though he sat at the feet of his grandfather, Pinchas was known for his act of violence that we read about in the Torah. The Torah tells of a great rebellion that was stirring among the Israelite camp. They were engaging in immoral acts, and little Pinchas stands up, he grabs a spear, and he kills the instigators in front of the people. Suddenly, the immorality ends, and, with, and a great plague kills all those who followed the immoral ways. Pinchas, a man of action, was an impassioned and zealous leader who, regardless of collateral damage, stood up and took action. But the rabbis disagree with this work of Pinchas. They question whether he was truly a great leader. They're uncomfortable with a leader who takes violence as a way and a means to an end. In fact, the Midrash says that Pinchas never dies. He's given the opportunity to redeem himself and his actions and to transform and change his ways. To learn to not to be quick-tempered and angry, but to seek peace and inner tranquility, as they believe that Pinchas actually becomes the prophet Elijah. And in every generation, Pinchas appears as Elijah doing acts of peace, not violence, in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. We have stories of sightings of Elijah the prophet in every day, in every generation, and even today, feeding the poor, resolving estranged relationships, bringing peace to families, performing acts of kindness. Through this one act of violence, Pinchas is given that reward of immortality, but it really is a mission to undo the violence that he did, to repair the world through peace, to bring together those who have broken off, split, or been forgotten, to make them whole again, as the Elijah that cultivates kindness, rewards goodness, and elevates acts of inner bravery in the face of adversity. Israel's leading writer, the late Amos Oz, in his last published book before his death was called Dear Zealots, Letter from a Divided Land. There, Amos Oz explains that there are two different types of leaders. Zealots speak in exclamation points, 
They are fanatics whose actions are pointed, imperative, and striking, coming from a rigid place. That is the exclamation point, that type of leadership. But Oz identifies a second type of leader, a second approach, which he calls the question mark of leadership. A leader who is filled with curiosity, patience, wonder, openness. He considers the question mark approach to leadership and to life, even in crisis, as the antidote and the opposite, opposite of impassioned, zealous leadership. And that's exemplified by the end example of leadership in our Parsha, the daughters of Tzlovchad. They are five sisters who approach Moses, Aaron, the high priest, the tribal chieftains, and the 70 elders with this request. Can we inherit the land that was due to our father? He has died but left no sons. Why should his family and name disappear? At this point, when the daughters of Tzlovchad stand up to the leadership, question the authority, why can't they inherit property simply because they are women? Everyone stands there in silence at this challenge. The question stumps even Moshe Rabbeinu, our great leader, Moses. So what does Moses do? But he asks God, who quickly responds, Cain. Yes, the daughters of Tzlovchad speak properly. With that statement, biblical law is rewritten and women are permitted to inherit property. This moment in our Torah portion serves as both a model and inspiration, for these great sisters have courage. They're not afraid to stand up, speak their mind, raise their voice for a cause which they believe is right. In the backdrop of these two leadership styles, the questioning and the exclamation part, the zealous, the peacemakers, and the one who strike, the most significant leadership question is asked, who will lead the people next? In our Parsha, the next leader of the Jewish people is actually chosen. But it isn't Pinchas, and it's not the daughters of Tzolofchad. It's not the exclamation point, and it's not the question mark. In a recently new published Torah commentary called Life Lessons from Recently Deceased Dead Rabbis, Chassidut for the People, by a, a colleague, a Pittsburgh conservative rabbi, Rabbi Mark Asher Goodman, which is a Hasidic Torah commentary. He also, in looking in this Parsha, asks, what type of leader can we be? Do we need to be? Do we need to govern us? And he's reflecting on this question that Moses asks. It's in Numbers chapter 27, verse 15. After the question mark approach and the exclamation point approach, Moses asks God, these words, let the Lord, source of all breath, breath and flesh, appoint someone over this community who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation will not be like sheep without a shepherd. In these words, there's a question of what type of leader should follow Moses? Who should be next? And though it doesn't say it quite here, the rabbis read into this request of Moses let the Lord, source of all breath and flesh, appoint someone over this community, that it is someone who will lead with exercise and exercising patience and forbearance, someone who will listen to every people for all breath and all person. As Rabbi Sachs says on this verse, leaders need to respect differences. Like the conductor of an orchestra, integrate them, ensuring they play their part in bringing harmony together. But then, when the Torah responds with who, who actually is the next leader of the Jewish people? Joshua. The next verse after this idea of who will lead the people out and who will bring them in. By the way, that means that it was a leader who will lead from the front, but also bringing them in. It's a leader who doesn't go too far. A leader who always makes sure that their people are with them. They are one step ahead, but that's it, not more than one step ahead. There, the next phrase is, God says the leader will be Yoshua ben Nun, Joshua the son of Nun, Ish Ruach, a man of spirit. Rabbi Sachs says on this, 
the most important word in the declaration and the commission and the choosing of Joshua is not ruach. You would have thought it was ruach. It was spirit or an inspired leader. Rabbi Sachs said it is ish. What does ish mean? Man. Now Rabbi Sachs says this. It's not that we're talking about a gender role or identity. It's not that the leader should be an ish, a male, but the leader should be a mensch. The leader of a people should not necessarily be based on a question mark, on an exclamation point, but should be based on being a mensch. The truth is we are all leaders, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's in shul. Some of us are quiet leaders. Some of us are loud leaders. Some of us are exclamation point leaders. Some of us are question mark leaders. But we have to learn to be an ish, a mensch, to be balanced and to be thoughtful, to be pacemaker, peacemakers, to speak up when necessary, to listen, and to be a mensch. Here in America, we often think that our leaders should be, in, we don't think, we do. Our leaders should be decisive. They should be loud. Think of FDRs. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We need to be bold and brave. George Washington, who crossed the Delaware in the middle of the freezing cold in the winter, decisive, loud, and brash leaders. But perhaps we also need inspiring leaders, bold leaders, outspoken leaders that can be balanced, like the conductor, that makes sure that there's always harmony and peace. So this Shabbat and every single day, whether we are big leaders or small leaders, leaders in our own makom or leaders in our entire community, may we learn to balance, to be the question mark, to be the exclamation part. Find when we must stand up and not strike like Pinchas, but let our voice be heard. And when we should be a question mark, when we should listen to others and to balance. And in that way, we can find our place and step up to be part of our community, to make our community even better. Shabbat Shalom.